Hi, this is Steve Thomas, pastor of the First Baptist Church at Delray Beach. Welcome to our podcast. We study God's Word to apply it to our lives in order to make a difference in this life and in eternity. We hope you enjoy this message. We cry out, we cry out. Well, I don't know about you, but this time of the year, so the other, I, I like to watch this channel sometimes called uh, Hallmark. Don't know if you've heard of it. The other night I was watching this movie. Maybe you've, maybe you saw it. It's it's the one where a pretty young girl from a big city, because of some kind of family emergency, comes back to a small town she was raised in. That is mind blowing, and and initially she runs into this man who's unbelievably handsome, which is shocking, at a small town and. And not a lot, they don't seem to, they seem to not like each other initially, but then they do, you know, and they kind of get together. It looks like they're going to mate, but then something happens. I, I don't know, I, I can't remember what happened, but something happened to cause there to be like almost an end of the relationship. But then miraculously, it all gets worked out, and there's a wonderfully happy ending. Have you seen, did you see it? Huh? Did you see, see that one? Now, some of you are laughing like, Maybe you've heard that story before, like in every Hallmark movie. I don't know if you have, but it's also the story behind A White Christmas. Sorry, that's a, uh, if you didn't know, that's, that's what happens there too. But it's a story we like. Why do we like this story? Because it's a great story. But it's not an original story. In our house, we call it the greatest story ever told. It's really the story of Jesus. He comes to earth right? He comes to earth, and initially there's some attraction, and people are getting along, but then there's a crisis, and they're like, I don't know if this is going to work out. He winds up getting crucified. He winds up rising from the dead, and then suddenly there's this huge, wonderful, happy ending as people embrace him, and people follow him, and his message spreads throughout the world. It's the greatest story ever told. It's why we love Hallmark movies, because they just adapted it from Jesus. You know, that's kind of how we want our life to go, kind of like a Hallmark movie, don't we? It's going to be exciting, but not too exciting. I like Hallmark movies, honestly, because you know you're not going to be sad at the end. And you know it's not going to be a lot of intellectual work, right? You're just going to get through it. Sometimes we think our life is supposed to be that way. It's supposed to be kind of linear. It's all going to work out, and we just kind of want things to keep going in the way they're going. It's going to be great. But then something happens, and it's a defining moment. And it happens in Hallmark movies, too. They just kind of soft sell. But it, 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 there's something happens, and it changes the trajectory of your entire life. It's the story of Jesus. It's the story of you, probably, and it's the story of Joseph. In Matthew chapter 1, beginning in verse 17. Matthew chapter 1, beginning in verse 17. Joseph husband of Mary, father of Jesus. Look with me at Matthew chapter 1, verse 17 says this. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to Christ, 14 generations. Now, honestly, how many of you skip that part when you read Matthew? Who cares about how many generations it was, right? Who cares? Well, if you read the actual generations, some very interesting things happen. You may wonder, why does God include these genealogies in the gospel? Well, one of the big reasons is it's very important to connect Jesus to Abraham because God called Abraham to father a people that would provide a blessing to all nations, and Jesus ultimately is that blessing. It's really important to connect those dots But there's something else in this genealogy, and you have to read close, pay attention, and not just try to get through it, to see that there are five women who are mentioned in this genealogy. Oftentimes people think, well, you know, the gospel that we preach is all this male-centered stuff, and women really, listen, women are vitally important in the whole story of salvation, including the Old Testament. And this genealogy points out four important women in the Old Testament, one in the New that are in the genealogy of Jesus. They're in the line of Jesus, and they have very amazing stories. It's important to understand this because this is where Joseph comes from 
the father of Jesus. The first woman is Tamar. She is the daughter-in-law of Judah, son of Jacob, right? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, 12 sons. Judah's one of them. He has a wicked son who marries a woman named Tamar, and God just basically kills that guy because he's too wicked. And his brother is supposed to become the husband. He's supposed to raise up offspring to his dead brother, but he refuses to, and so God kills him. And so Judah decides that this woman, Tamar, is, she's, man, she's bad news. She's cursed. We need to get rid of her. And he promises to give her his third son when he grows up. He apparently is not of age yet. And so Tamar is put away with her father and kind of discredited and assumed to be the problem, right? They always blame the woman. But Tamar does something very shrewd. She puts a veil over her face. She dresses as a prostitute. And she comes and Judah asks her for her services. And she obliges. But she gets his signet staff And so something that identifies him, and when she gets pregnant, people say, oh, she's evil, she's immoral. Actually, it was Judah who is even more immoral, and Judah points that out. And Tamar winds up in the line of Jesus and Joseph. See, God redeemed her, even though she was discredited, even though she was badly abused. God put her in the line of Joseph and of Jesus then there's another woman, her name is Rahab. Remember Rahab, city of Jericho? She is the what? The prostitute who helps who help hide the spies who came from the children of Israel to spy out the city. Rahab was saved in the, in the, in the city in, when they um, came into the city. Rahab winds up being in the line of Joseph, in the line of Jesus as well. This prostitute is redeemed And she is the mother of none other than Boaz. Boaz is the wife of, I mean, is the husband of another important woman who is Ruth, who is also a foreigner. She is a Moabitess. And Ruth was married to the son of Naomi for 10 years, produced no offspring. And again, it's the woman's fault. Assumed to be infertile, after 10 years, you could divorce your wife and you could get another one because she didn't provide you offspring. But instead, Naomi's son dies. Ruth goes with Naomi back to her land, and she marries Boaz. And she has a son named Obed, who is the father of Jesse, who is the father of David in the line of Jesus. And Ruth is redeemed, even though there was these these suspicions about her ability to bear children. And there's one more. Probably... I think one of the most surprising, there's this woman whose name is Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, involved in this sordid affair with David, has a child. David has her husband killed. The child dies, and you think that's the end of the story for Bathsheba. No, she's redeemed as well because she has, she bears Solomon, the king of Israel following David. Four women, and as the biblical scholar Craig Blumberg says, the factor that clearly applies to all four is the suspicion of illegitimacy surrounding their sexual activity and childbearing. This suspicion of illegitimacy fits perfectly with that which surrounded Mary. I love this. I love how God put in the genealogy the heritage of his son and of Joseph, these four women that he redeemed. Some absolutely innocent. Some God redeemed. But four key women are in the genealogy of Jesus and are mentioned in the genealogy in Matthew. So we see that Joseph had the history, he had the heritage to be a suitable father to Jesus and a suitable husband to Mary, who we're going to see in the next verse, has a pregnancy that didn't come from her husband. I love how God prepares us for his specific assignment. Chapter uh, 1, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. 
you have to understand betrothal, and maybe you do. Betrothal in those days was like engagement today, except when you became betrothed to someone, you were legally committed. To break a betrothal was divorce. So you were already legally married, but you had not come together to live under the same roof or to come together physically, sexually, yet. There's a time in there, there's a space in there, and that was the time of preparation, and the husband was supposed to go to his father's house and to prepare a place for his new family. Hence, Jesus in chapter 14 says, I go to prepare a place for you. In my father's house are many dwelling places. I'm betrothed to you. Ultimately, I will come and get you, and you will live in my father's house. That's the idea of betrothal. So Joseph is betrothed to Mary, but there's no physical activity yet, and Mary is found to be with child. A very scary place to be. And here's Joseph. He's built his life. He's planned out his life. He's got this woman. He wants to marry her. He's committed to her, and now she's found with child. But Joseph is a just man. He's a man who wants to live and generally organizes his life around the commandments of God. He wants to live in a way that honors God and is a righteous man. But he's also unwilling to bring shame on Mary. He's trying to hold these things in tension. He's a just man, but unwilling to put her to shame. He wants to obey God and do the right thing, but he also does not want to harm Mary. He's not a vindictive man. He cares for this woman that he believes right now has been unfaithful to him, and he doesn't want to see her hurt. I love that combination. It sounds familiar if you're familiar with the gospel, because Jesus Christ himself did exactly that, didn't he? He fulfilled the righteousness of God by being the perfect sacrifice, all the time protecting us, his bride, who had been unfaithful to him. See, the character of Jesus is already in Joseph. What a perfect father for Jesus. This man who wanted to fulfill the righteousness of God, he's a just man, but he wants to protect Mary. See, Joseph was uniquely prepared to be the husband of Mary and the father of of Jesus. So Joseph had the history, the heritage to be the father of Jesus. He, he had the character, the perspective, the preparation to be the father of Jesus. And he also had the relationship to be the father of Jesus. He was betrothed to Mary. He was in a very unique and specific position to be the father of Jesus. It's amazing how God did that. He brought him to this point of being the father of Jesus, but there's a crisis. This woman seems to be pregnant outside of marriage. Verse 20. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David. I love how they bring the heritage back in, right? They're bringing that. You were prepared for this. Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by a prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. This is the moment of truth, amen? Wait a minute, I've got my life planned out. I've, I've been living in the favor of God. Things are going good. I've got my career established. My reputation is set. And now I find out this woman that I'm supposed to marry is with child. But God, you're telling me to marry her anyway? That it's your, your Holy Spirit that's doing this in her life? You know, you've got to believe Joseph would have missed his whole assignment if God hadn't spoken. Oh, but God did speak, didn't he? God did speak. And we always wonder, well, how did God actually speak? Because I've had some weird dreams myself, amen? I had a PTSD dissertation defense dream the other night. 
I still am traumatized that I had to defend this dissertation and that it didn't go well, right? And the dream was this, that I had written this dissertation and it was on composers of hymns. I don't know why. It's not what I wrote at all. And, and I got in the defense and I had forgotten to do the part where you actually examine hymns. You ever have those dreams? Now, that's not God speaking. That's just your crazy mind. But God spoke to Joseph so he could understand. Today, we have the Holy Spirit who speaks to our hearts. Amen? That's why prayer is so important. That's why studying his word, what he's already said, God speaks through his word. He speaks through prayer. That's why being a part of a church where other people can speak into your life, the words of God is so important. God speaks so that we can understand. And believe me, he knows how to speak so you can understand. He knows your language. So because God spoke, Joseph heard. Even though Joseph had enjoyed God's favor and life was pretty good, and this would threaten to ruin his life, Joseph responds to God's speaking. Let me ask you, have you ever had God's favor in your life? Things were going good, but then God gave you an assignment that threatened to kind of rock your world. Something came up, something happened, maybe something that you didn't even want to happen. And it rocked your world. And you had to hear the voice of God to know this is what you should do anyway. And you say, well, this kind of comes out of left field. You know, here's Joseph. He's going along, do dee do everything's fine. And then God says, wait a minute, Mary's pregnant. And by the way, it's by the Holy Spirit, and it's going to be amazing. You need to be her husband. I don't think so. I had to go to a different church, read a different Bible, something. It seems to come out of left field. But you know, the reality is God does this all the time. If you read the Old Testament and you read all of Scripture, you know that God does this frequently. One of the first cases is in the book of Genesis when he says to Noah, Noah, you're a guy who follows me. You've tried to arrange your life. You're not perfect, but you're a just man. You walk with me. And Noah's probably thinking, yeah, thanks, God. That's awesome. You know, I just want to live another 500 years. Things are going to be good. I'm really enjoying this fact that there's no rain. You know, it's really good. And what does he say to him? No, I want you to build a boat. No, I want you to preach a 100-year sermon. This sermon's not going to be 100 years, but hang in there. I want you to preach a 100-year sermon. You're going to do a 100-year object lesson that the world is evil and it's coming to an end, and I'm going to flood it all, and you're going to build a boat, even though there's never been any rain. But It's going to rain, it's going to flood everything, and you're going to save creation, Noah. I don't know, God. God does this. God does this. You know, you can't say no to God and continue to walk with God. I wonder, has something happened in your life when you said no to God? I can't take that assignment. And you wonder why you're distant from him. Jonah said yes to God. He preached a hundred-year sermon. He wound up saving creation. Abraham, I mentioned earlier, God said to him, Abraham, you're a good man. You got your family all around. You're in a city. Things are good. You're in your 70s. Things are good. You live out the rest of your life. He says, no, I want you to go to a land that I will show you. God, could I have a map, GPS, something? No, I want you to go to a land I will show you. Speaks to Abraham, rocks Abraham's world. He goes out and he raises up a nation that would bless the world. And then there's the Joseph of Genesis. Something happens to him that he didn't want to happen at all. His brothers sell him into slavery. He winds up in Egypt. You'd think at this point he would be so mad, so angry with God that he would just lay down and die, but he doesn't. Somehow he's faithful. He rises up through the government. God blesses him. And at some point, he's not mad at his brothers anymore. Because when they come to him and he could have the opportunity to wipe them off the face of the earth and the justification to do so, he says, God meant it for evil, but God, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. 
the bad thing that happened to me that you caused, God meant it for good because because of this, I'm able to save God's people and save this ultimate blessing that's going to come through Jesus Christ. Maybe you've had that happen in your life. Something happened you didn't even want to happen. But God has been using it for good ever since. Or maybe you missed it. Maybe you missed the opportunity to follow God. Maybe you're Jonah. And the word of the Lord came to you and said, listen, I want you to share the gospel with these pagan people next door called the, called the Ninevites. And you said, you know what? I think I would rather go to Alabama. I think I want to go to nice people, pleasant people, Kentucky people, southern people. I don't want to go talk to these people next to me. And you wind up in the belly of the whale crying out to God, I'm so sorry, you needed to turn me around. Recently, Julie and I were traveling back from Kentucky on I-75. And on I-75, as you come down through Gainesville, Ocala, and then there's Wildwood, where you get on this magical road known as the Turnpike that takes you to this incredible place called South Florida. If you miss that turn, you're doomed, and you never get to make it at all. Because you get further away from South Florida, not closer. You go to this place called Tampa. I know somebody from Tampa, but it's not the same. So we, we came up to Wildwood. We got off and got gas. We got back on the highway, and I got on the wrong ramp. Oh, if you've ever done that, it's one of the worst feelings. It's seven miles before you can turn around. And all that time, you're thinking, oh, my goodness, it's, we're going to lose 15 minutes. We get turned around. We're headed north on I-75. I'm thinking, okay, another seven minutes, I can get off on the turnpike, and I can head down to the magical place called South Florida. It's going to be great. I can't wait to get home. It's going to be good. But there's a little known fact. I don't know if you know this, but if you're going north on I-75, you can't exit onto the turnpike. They punish you <laughs> because they know you made a mistake. So they punish you. The, the, the civil engineers decided you can't make that turn, so you have to go north of the turnpike 10 miles where there's traffic and you're just, you're just getting a little bit upset at this point. I mean, other people were. I was not. I was very happy. I was joyful. Here we go. We're just driving around. 45 minutes around Wildwood. I know the whole area by now. I'm thinking, man, that nasty chicken that got starts to sound good. You're thinking, traffic. We get turned around. Finally, we get turned around. We're heading down the road, and Julie and I are both have our eyes on the road. She's got her eyes on GPS. I'm looking at the road. I'm I'm not going to miss it. I'm not going to miss it. I'm not going to miss it. And we get on the road, and we get on the turnpike, and everything's wonderful and good. That's what happens when we miss God sometimes. It takes some work to get turned back around. Sometimes you go back and miss it again. Sometimes it's not available at that time. Sometimes you wind up in something that takes a long time before you ever can get turned back around to follow into where he, where he wanted you to be anyway. Has that happened to you? Praise God that he's a God of second chances. You may have missed time, you may have missed opportunities, but there's always time to get on his agenda and to answer his call. See, God brings us to this Joseph moment. And many of you have had more than one. For many times in your life, you've looked and you've seen, God totally adjusted my life at this point. It was an opportunity that I said yes to, or maybe it was something that happened to you that you didn't even like, but God adjusted your life. I lost my dad 19 years ago. It was horrible. I hated it. I would love for him to be here today. But I have to tell you, God changed my life through that. As I grew up, as I learned to live by the standards he raised me by, not able to talk to him every day, became more dependent on Christ. Maybe that happened to you. It happened to Joseph. He couldn't know what was ahead. He couldn't know that he would have to take this baby and flee to this place called Egypt in order to protect the baby from Herod. He couldn't know that, but he knew it was going to change his life. So in verse 24, he makes a decision. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife. He knew her not until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Joseph wakes up from the dream. He's heard from God. 
and he doesn't do what I would do, which is, I had to think about this, you know. I need to call 15 friends, and we'll take a survey. Who thinks I should do this? Who thinks I should? No, he knew what God said. He didn't wait. He acted immediately to become the husband of Mary and the father of Jesus. Have you had that defining moment? Maybe that's happening right now. Maybe there's something in your life that you know God is calling you to do, but you're saying, you know what? That's not how I planned it. It's not really what I wanted to do. I was 39 years old. Y'all know the story. Life was good. We had God's favor. We were, had family all around. Things were fine. Lived in Kentucky. Really nice. Loved it. And God said, I, I want you to go into vocational ministry. It seemed kind of wrong. To give up my life, I have the responsibility of raising my children. This is where I should be, to leave my family, leave my extended family. Yes. Yes. See, God's call doesn't always fit into your plan, and it may even seem wrong. But when you look at it from God's perspective, it's exactly right. And that's the perspective we need to be looking at. See, the Joseph moment is God's call in your life to do what you are uniquely positioned to do. No one else could do it as well as Joseph. No one else had the heritage, had the character, had the relationship to be Mary's husband and Jesus' father. What has God uniquely called you to do? What has he called you to do? It may be to do something you're not even looking forward to doing. Maybe a role in caring for someone. Maybe a role in reaching out for someone. Maybe a role in restructuring your life. It may be a move to the other side of the world. What is God calling you to do? That you have a unique heritage, history, character, preparation, and opportunity to do. He's positioned you to do that. See, when we come to Jesus, that's the first one of those moments, isn't it? When we realize that our lives, the way we're going to live it, even at a young age, is not going to be enough. It's not going to get us out of this life alive. That's the first come to Jesus moment where I say, I'm going to adjust my life, Jesus. I'm putting my life in your hands. I'll go where you want me to go. For the Apostle Paul, this was the road to Damascus. He had many others along the way where God would say, Paul would say, I want to go this way. The Spirit would say, no, I want you to go that way. Have you had that first moment where you've said yes to Jesus? I need you to save me. I need you to forgive me. I place my life in your hands. You had that first moment. If you've had that moment, hopefully you've been baptized as well, where you've said, I want to demonstrate to the world what God has done in my life. I want to do this publicly. I want everyone to understand that I belong to Jesus. In a moment, we're going to symbolically do that again as we receive the Lord's Supper. Does that happen in your life? How do you view the other events where he's changed your life? He's adjusted your trajectory. He sent you in a different way. Do you see those as blessings from him? Do you see that as Joseph moments? Do you see that as preparation to do what only you can do? Things like being a parent to your child, a husband to your wife, to fill a role only you can fill. Do you see that as a blessing from God? even in the difficult times, even in the challenging days we don't understand why we run into Egypt. See, God calls us to those moments where we're going to have to ask him, is this of you? And when he says yes, we have to say, God, my hands are open. Take out what you want. I'll receive what you want to put in. But I want to fulfill the unique call you have on my life. It may be to take a role in the church that you said, you know what, I've never really done that before. I don't know if I can. Don't know if I. Does, do you belong to him or not? Does he get to call you or not? Is he your shepherd or not? There's nothing more wonderful than being right in the middle of where God wants you to be. Where you can see he's given you the preparation, the character, and the relationship to do what he wants you to do. I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer. And during that time, 
I want you to think about those times in your life. If you haven't had one yet, there may be one coming next year in the new year. Maybe a new opportunity, a new call in your life, a new place he wants you to be, a new commitment to him. After I pray, we're going to have a time of your own time before the Lord, and then I'm going to invite you to come down and get your elements. Listen, don't come if you're saying no to God today. If you're mad at him about the life he's given you that you can't seem to get out of, if you're not happy about the adjustments, don't come. Don't come because you're not all in. You're at odds with God. So when we take the Lord's Supper, we're saying, Jesus, I, I'm in on this new covenant. I'm a follower of yours. If you call me to be the, hus- the father of Jesus, the, the husband of Mary, if you, if I'm in. If you call me to take care of someone, to change my life, to adjust my life in a certain way, God, I'm there. If you call my life, my wife, if you call me in my life just to be a good friend to the people around me and to share your love with them, I'm there. Would you pray with me? Thanks for joining us today. If you'd like to support this ministry, go to our website at fbcdelray.com. Also, click the share button so you can share this message with a friend or someone in need as we seek to know Jesus, to know others, and to make him known. We cry out, we cry out.